much for coming out this evening. We weren't sure how many of you might be on holiday this evening. Turns out a few are still around, or like myself, actually this is part of your Easter holiday, which is very lovely. And how lovely to be out in the beautiful sunshine and a light evening, which we've not seen for a while in Boscanova. So, coming on to this evening's talk, you may recognise our fabulous speaker this evening, Sharon, who is one of Café Scientifique's uh, conveners here in Bournemouth. Sharon's original PhD was in biological sciences. Uh, she's been a researcher at AECC for a number of years. She wouldn't tell me quite how many, but I'm sure if you press her later with wine, she might kind of give you some more information. Before we kick off with her absolutely fascinating sounding talk, and I don't know how many of you have had a, a go, I, I thought I was perfectly straight, but I have no doubt that I will be proved wrong on this. Um, but before we start, for those of you that are new to Café Scientifique here in Bournemouth, please do come and grab a drink anytime. These guys, as ever, are fabulous in terms of making sure we're all well looked after. We will be taking some photographs. If that's a problem for you to be able for us to use them in publicity, just let me know and we will ensure that your face does not appear. And also, we're on various social networks. Some of us already know us on Facebook. We will be tweeting in the evening using the hashtag Cafeside Bosconova. Is that right? Cafe Sign Bosconova. Um, and so please do follow us and spread the word. But without further ado, I'd like to hand over to the absolutely fabulous Shepherd. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. And as Becca has just said, thank you for coming out tonight. It's nice to see some people that are still stalwarts and coming along even though we've got the school holidays and everybody's trying to recover from a long weekend. Hopefully this will give you a bit of fun and what we've done is we've, we've already run a bit of an experiment beforehand um, but we'll redo it during the break so that if you want to take part in the test you can do so during the break and we'll put all the results together and by the end of the evening we'll get an idea of what the folks of Café Sai Boscanova are like at perceiving vertical. I can say nothing, I'm absolutely rubbish. <laughs> okay, so just to begin with, something that you should be pretty familiar with. It's called the Leaning Tower of Pisa for a reason. It's not straight. So, clue number one, this is not vertical. Okay? <laughs> um, but just to give you a clue, if you have a look, um, if you put a vertical line up against it, you can see exactly how not vertical it is. Okay, so just a pointer. So it's something that we're all familiar with. So if we were to do an engineering job and try and straighten up the Leaning Tower of Pisa, how much would we need to move it? So what we're going to do, sorry, <laughs> what we're going to do is just move it a few degrees either way and then you can judge which one you think is vertical. Okay, so that's our first option. That's our second option. And option number three is this one. So which one do you think is actually vertical? Yes. Two. 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 Three. 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 So how many for two? Okay. And then how many for three? So we've got more people for three. Just remember this step. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so it's not one. <laughs> And then if we put a line up against it, you'll see that actually it's not number two, that it's still not vertical when you go to number two. But da 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 Number three, <laughs> Alex, <laughs> is the one that's actually vertical. And so something that you might think should be quite obvious is actually quite tricky. So how do we actually perceive vertical? When we're making decisions about how or where vertical is, obviously one of the major things that we're using are our visual signals, okay? The information that we're getting through our eyes. But that's not the only sense that we're using. We've also got the vestibular system. Now the vestibular system's within your inner ears. And what that's doing is it's telling you where you are with respect to gravity. 
you're tilting your head from side to side, there's all sorts of information that's happening that's being passed along to your brain that's saying you're tilting your head from side to side. Okay? And on top of that, we have all sorts of sensors in our muscles and our joints that tell our brain where each one of the joints and muscles is compared to all the rest of them. So all of this information is being put together and finally it's being processed by the brain so all the information is integrated and through all that the brain actually comes up with an idea of where it thinks vertical is. Okay, So just something to remember as we move through this series of slides. So let's come back to our idea of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Again, we're back to the one that isn't straight, just a reminder. Um, but if you look at this photograph, think back to what we were saying about visual signals being very important, okay? Can you see other things that can tell you where vertical is? Okay, there are other signals stimuli within it, if you just look at the edge of the, the actual photograph, that gives you a very good idea. Compare the leaning tower to where the side of the photograph is, you can see it's not in line with it, it's not vertical. There are other points, like all the columns within the building next to it. Those, again, are telling you where vertical is. That building's not leaning over to the side. So all of this tells us all sorts of clues about where vertical is. Now, if you look around you, how many pieces of information can you see in this room around you that actually tell you where vertical is? So there's all sorts of things. There's the door, there's the side of the bar, there's where we are relative to the roof. All of this is giving your brain information about where vertical is. And it's something that we just take for granted that we're not actually thinking about when we're processing the information. So then we come to the one that we said where the, the actual tower was then straight. But now what's happened is the surroundings have tilted. And that's why it makes it a bit more difficult to try and decide whether or not the tower is actually straight in this thing. Okay, because in this photo, it's a surrounding frame that's tilted. So again, we've got information within that picture that's then confusing your brain because it's thinking, hang on a second, we've no longer got a side of the photograph that's vertical. What are we supposed to do with this information? Okay, a minute ago, the tower was off vertical. Now it's everything else that's tilted. So your brain's trying to overcome those confusing signals and make sense of it. And it does that by going turning towards its other senses, like vestibular system and also proprioception, that gives it information about where vertical is. And that's what it's doing all the time. So then if we add it in here, you can see we've got the lines that are no longer vertical, but we've got that the tower is now vertically positioned. So this is what you call the tilt illusion. Okay, and it's something that you're dealing with if you come up and do the test. It's part of what we're testing you on, is that tilt illusion. And the fact that because some things are slightly off, it makes it very difficult to decide where vertical actually is. Now, one of the most common ways of measuring people's perceptions of vertical is through the rod and frame test. Originally, these tests had to take part in a large room that contained a huge big wooden frame and a rod inside that frame that were painted with fluorescent paint. <coughs> the room itself then had to be made completely dark so that all you could see was the actual frame and the rod. Okay, so. You can imagine that wasn't easy to do. We certainly wouldn't have been able to run that experiment in here this evening. So this was also done either without the presence of a frame. So in other words, all that the person could see was the rod or in the presence of a tilted frame. 
and the subject was then asked to move, either instruct the operator as to how to move the rod till it became into a vertical position. Alternatively, some were set up with machinery so that the, test, the person being tested could actually manoeuvre the rod themselves. But again, the similar sort of thing is what you, you'll do if you're doing the test this evening, is that the rod needed to be manoeuvred until it became a vertical position, or what the viewer perceived as being a vertical position. So, obviously, with the angle of the, the frame, you get different effects. If the frame isn't tilted, then it's quite easy to make a decision as to where vertical is, isn't it? You're given cues, you can see round about the frame, you've got two lines that tell you where vertical is. So if you go smack bang in the middle of those two lines and line up with that, then you've got a pretty good guess that that's where you are. So all you're doing is lining it up with the middle of where those two vertical lines are. Now, Similarly, if the frame gets tilted to 45 degrees, so all that's happened is it's turned round, then again, it's quite easy to make a decision as to where vertical is, isn't it? Because all you're doing is you're dropping the line down from one point down to the next. And as long as you're lining it up with where those points are, then you're pretty sure that's where you are with vertical. So again, that's relatively easy. But it'd be no fun if we made you do a test that was like that, because you'd know where it was. <laughs> okay? We do use the square frame, the untilted frame, because that gives a very good idea of a control situation. So when a person's given the information as to where vertical is, how good are they at actually deciding what point vertical is at? But what needs to happen is to bring around that illusion resulting from the tilted frame, it needs to be somewhere between 0 and 45 degrees. Okay, so what tends to be used and what seems to be about the optimum, according to the literature, is about 18 degrees. So if the frame's tilted 18 degrees, it becomes a bit more difficult to try and decide where vertical is. Okay, so compared to these two, this is far more difficult. But again, it is possible, except not for some of us, because as I get said, I'm rubbish. Okay, so this is the effect that the different angles of the frame have. So, as I said, optimally, you're going for something between those. Something that's going to elicit some sort of confusing signal to your brain and make it a bit more difficult to make the decision. And obviously, if you're challenging the visual system, then you're relying on the brain being able to adopt the information from some of your other systems that will help you make that decision. So that's what we're doing. We're messing with your mind. <laughs> so when this happens, it results in different types of errors. Okay? Um, there are some very good people that aren't really affected by the frame at all. Okay? That you can put a frame in there, tilt it around, and they seem to know where vertical is. In other words, they're very good at swapping between the different types of input and overcoming confusing si um, signals. Those people are less reliant on their visual signals and are able to pick up on more internal signals such as proprioception and vestibular system. Okay, so they're using internal cues rather than looking towards the outside. What happens with most people is that in the, the error that they produce goes in the direction of the frame tilt. So if the frame's tilted towards the right, the error, to, error tends to be slightly towards the right. And if the frame's tilted towards the left, again, it's slightly towards the left. And in most cases, this error is very small. It tends to be, in most people, it's within about three degrees either side of vertical. Alternatively, you get some people that overcompensate for this confusing stimulus. So what they're doing is they're 
they can also be overthinking it. It's a case of, I know that this frame is tilted, what do I need to do to overcome that? What do I need to do to cheat, almost, on this test? And make sure that I'm going slightly towards where I think it should be, so that I overcome the fact that this is trying to fill my brain. Some people take it far too seriously. <laughs> and that can end up in a negative frame effect. In other words, they're overcompensating and taking it slightly too far in the other direction. So what happens there is that it's either to the left when the frame's tilted to the right, or alternatively their errors to the right when the flame, flame? frame is tilted to the left. This is without alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem. Okay, so the other thing that happens is that you get some people that are termed side dependent. And what those people are doing is rather than trying to line it up with where they think vertical is, which is what we're happening with the top row, they're actually lining it up with the frame. And this could be for several reasons. It could be that that's how they perceive vertical, although we doubt that very much. A lot of the time, what we think is happening is that they're not actually understanding the test or they're forgetting what the task actually is. We'll get back to that a bit later. So those are all the types of resulting errors or the majority of the resulting types of errors that you can get. So what happens in children is that we've been in myself and the wonderful Jeff Bagast who's also here this evening. Those of you that have been to a few might have came along to the first one might have remembered that Jeff gave the first talk here at Cafe Scientific in Boscanova. Um, we've been involved in this study looking at school children and what's happened is we've followed this group of school children over several years. So it started when they were about <coughs> 7 to 8 and it finished when they were 11 to 12. And can you see at the back? what's happening with the graphs. You don't really need to be able to see the actual details of the graphs. But as you can see, there's sort of a pattern where it's more spread out at the top. And as the children become older, it becomes more condensed so that you've got more of a bump in the middle. So it goes from something that's relatively flat and spread out to something that's quite condensed. Essentially, what's happening with this is that the children are moving more and more towards the adult pattern of what we see with perception of vertical. So here we have the development of perception of vertical in these children. Now something else you might see, so the ends, for those that can't see, the ends of the two um, of the axes are at minus 20 and plus 20. Now if you think back to what was the angle of the frame that we were talking about? 18 degrees, wasn't it? So what we're getting here is that we're getting some children that are grouped around the angle of the frame. There. Okay, so obviously what these children are doing is they're either not understanding the test or this is their way of coping with the confusing stimulus is just to line it up with the side of the frame. So they're lining it up with the frame rather than with where, the, where vertical is. And as you can see, that there are still some of them even all the way through, even to the older group of children. The other thing you'll see is the black bars are when the frame's tilted to the right and the white bars are when the frame's tilted towards the left. And this is, we're seeing a typical pattern for the majority of them, that especially here, we've got a big condensing of results round about where we would expect the majority of people to be. So within four degrees in this case, really, of where vertical is. But you've also got some black bars that are appearing on this side of the graph and some white bars that are appearing on that side of the graph and that's when we're picking up negative frame effects. Okay so we've got people that are scoring into the negative when the frame's tilted to the right and into the positive when the frame's tilted to the left. 
So here we can illustrate all of those types of people and all of those strategies of errors within these graphs. So what happens once we move into older people? So looking at adults, here we've got a group of healthy adults that we've tested. And you can see that there's much more of a clumping round about where zero degrees is. Okay, But again, you've got a couple of people that are showing negative frame effects. So we've got some green on, uh, some blue on that side, and we've got some green on this side, but not a lot, not as much as you see with the children. And again, you're the, uh, the, 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 the actual errors only go up to less than 10 degrees. So we're not seeing anybody that's lining it up with the side of the frame. So that's disappeared with the group of adults that we're dealing with. So the numbers that we've got are actually quite high, like the group of four, the school children we were able to follow, we've got over 400 school children and these are the same ones that we've been able to track throughout time. So it's not as if they're different groups. These are the exact same children. And then with this, we've got over 100, mainly students from the ACC and some of the staff members, <laughs> um, who are always very willing to take part, which is great. Um, and you can see here that we've got an adult pattern. So what happens once we start getting into older adults? So this was part of a study that we did that was looking at people with Parkinson's disease. It turns out that there wasn't really any effect with regards to perception of vertical with the patients that had Parkinson's disease they weren't that much different from the control group. So what I've done here is combined both of them. So this is a group, and here we're dealing with adults that are 60 to up to about 85 years old. So we're dealing with an older group of adults than we were before. And what you can see from this is that we're starting to get a stretching out again of the errors. So we had a tight clump in the middle, with the, the adults that we were dealing with, I think 18 to about 50 odds was the majority of people in that middle group. So here we're dealing with older adults that are then on the other side and we've got a stretching of the range. Okay, so we've got more error coming in. And again, we've still got some negative frame effects, but we've also got the reintroduction of people that are lining it up with the frame rather than lining it up with where they think vertical is. And that's it there, okay, on one side of it. So that's what we're finding is the main thing, um, is we've got this pattern of distribution of people's errors as they develop and as they go from being children through to adults, through to older adults. It's something that we'd like to look at further and increase the numbers, but it gives us a pretty I good idea of what's going on. So again, we've got 94 people that took part in this study. So, what's all of this telling us? So if we go back to this idea of all of this information as being integrated. Now what happens if you have somebody that's got a particularly high error for example, it could be that there's something wrong with one of these systems. Okay. Now, in the case of when the frame isn't tilted, or if there's no frame at all, it tends to be that if they've got a high error, then there's something wrong, there's some sort of injury to the brain that's causing a problem with the integration of that information. Because it means that their internal representation is out for some reason. And that could be particularly if they've had a stroke or some sort of brain injury or some sort of tumour that they've had operated on. This tends to influence that section of it. The other problem is that if there's a problem with the vestibular system. 
Now if you think about it, the main thing that you're using is vision when you're deciding where vertical it is. So then when we give you a tilted frame, we're challenging these other two systems. So if you've then got a problem with your vestibular system, then that's going to challenge you even more than it would if your vestibular system was working normally, isn't it? So people that have got some sort of vestibular problem, problem with their inner ear, suffering from dizziness, or other diseases that are so associated with the vestibular system, they tend to have higher errors when the frame's tilted because they're not able to overcome that confusing visual stimulus and decide where vertical is from there. Okay, and the other thing that we've found in some of our most recent work is looking at patients with neck pain. And what we think is happening there is that it's their proprioception that's being challenged. There have been various studies that have been done where people's proprioception have been artificially um, changed through vibration, um, and it's found that that causes increases in people's errors. So the chances are it's probably to do with proprioception and the, the muscles in the neck that are causing confusing signals as well. So the brain's having to be challenged even more because two of the systems are being challenged. Okay, you've got confusing information becoming because the frame's tilted. We saw all that from the Leaning Tower of Pisa, the photo being tilted. And you've also got wrong information coming from your joints. And that results in a small group of people, it's not everybody, but there are certain groups of neck pain patients that show very high errors. Which is something interesting to look into further. So the title of my talk was Keeping Upright. So if we go back to, just go back a slide again, all of these systems that we're using here to decide where vertical is are also involved in keeping us upright and helping us maintain our balance and obviously giving our bodies information as to where, when we're upright and when we're horizontal. That may depend on how many drinks you have this evening, but that's <laughs> out with my control. Another challenge to all of this system. So that's where that ties in, that we're dealing with systems that are also feeding back to help us with our balance. Obviously the visual input is something that you can test quite easily. If you try and balance with your eyes closed, it's much more difficult than when your eyes are open, isn't it? Not recommended at this point in time, I don't want anybody falling over <laughs> tables. So, if you combine this idea of all of these things are linked to how people balance, with the idea that as the, adult, the older adults have got a wider range of errors, that you've got some people that struggle more to overcome that confusing tilted frame stimulus, then you've got a situation where those people might be more prone to falls. And this is something that some of the literature has looked at, but the results have been far from um, conclusive. But, but a lot of that depends on how you look at the actual data. Some of the other things that Jeff and I have started looking at are things like the amount of time it takes somebody to, take, to complete the study. There are some things where some people take much longer just to actually make a decision as to where vertical is than others do. But you've also got people that take much longer <coughs> than they, to, when the frame is tilted than when they do when the frame isn't tilted. And that's something, again, that may give us some sort of information about how people cope with confusing stimuli in their environment. And again, it's something else to look at. And that, I think, is time for me to have something to drink. <laughs> what we'll do... <laughs> Thanks.